First off, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it may as well just do some introductions of the people we have that's still on stage. Um, we've got a DID intern. How are you doing, man? Uh, sorry, who's, who's behind the profile? Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Someone can just give me a thumbs up, please. <laughs> so, um, okay. We, we can hear you. Yeah, we yeah, you. sure. Um, thank you very much for, uh, you know, arranging this again. I love to come on your uh, meets uh uh, and yeah, hi, my name is Vikram and I'm co-founder at HyperSign. HyperSign is a layer one identity infrastructure. Uh, uh, now we are in a state when we have the ID infrastructure sorted and we are reaching to for the final testnet. And we have started uh, looking at two different, uh, you know, approaches for go to market. The first one in Web3 space, we are looking at uh, regulated uh, DeFi uh, side and in the Web2 side uh, we recently had some partnerships with uh, uh, you know identity management companies so so yeah looking forward to you know launching uh, the app chain very soon thank you 100% Vikram it's really good to have you on I think we've had you on a couple of times before Vikram from HyperSign, uh, the, the, the protocol is amazing. Vikram is absolutely amazing as a guest. He's always got some amazing takes for us. So thank you, Vikram. Uh, we've also got Pyman, uh, Pyman from Fairblock. Uh, how are you doing today? Hey, hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Or is it working? I can hear you just fine, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm really happy to be here with all of the privacy flows. Uh, so my name is Payman. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Fairblock. Uh, in Fairblock, we are working on uh, enabling applications and like other protocols with pre-execution privacy and conditional encryption. Uh, other than the buzzwords, it actually means that like we can enable some of the applications that are limited so far in the for the decentralized like infrastructures, and uh, we can make the UX and experience better for the like normal DeFi users. So we we are trying to protect the users' uh, transactions and the contents of their messages uh, from like malicious bots, or simply we are trying to like enable some kind of applications like uh, Silbit auctions, private governance for customers chains, or even on the gaming side, there is like some applications like poker or like a lot of like betting applications that you actually need to uh, keep your votes or your hand private during the execution of your transactions. So yeah, happy to be here. Uh, and yeah, with like a lot of the big guys in the privacy space in Cosmos. Absolutely amazing, man. Absolutely amazing. It's really good to have another another uh, another protocol up here. We're trying to get rid of the bots uh, and trying to uh, increase civil resistance, trying to get uh, real human beings uh, interacting and transacting. Uh, it's a very, very noble goal. <laughs> okay, everyone. Um, so, um, Hoss, I don't know, have we, have we lost a uh, secret or, or we, do we have anyone else on stage? I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anyone because my clearly Twitter is messing up today. It looks like we did lose a guy from secret, actually. Let me see. Yeah. I just saw Patrick here. Um, oh. Yeah, Patrick. No, I just seen Alex actually. Yeah, I just invited Alex up as a speaker. Hopefully, we can get him back up. Alex, welcome to the stage. Uh, apologies for the technical issues. Uh, welcome. How are you doing? Hey guys, uh, doing uh, doing great personally. I'm calling out of Israel, so you know, as a, as a country, not doing really great right now. But we'll leave that aside. Uh, yeah, so I actually recently joined Secret Network as uh, CEO. Before that, I uh, was CEO of another Layer 1 project called Beam, Layer 1 Privacy Coin. Uh, it was uh, about three, four years ago, and uh, my last gig was uh, building a novel kind of DEX on Polygon. So here I am. Uh, Secret is one of the older, uh, oldest uh, confidential computing blockchains in the Cosmos ecosystem. 
and we're using the TEE, Trusted Execution Environment, uh, technology to protect uh, inputs and outputs um, and states of all the contracts. And we have all kinds of applications starting from DeFi, uh, governance, gaming, NFTs, and a lot more. And in the coming year, we'll be moving towards exporting our privacy solutions to other ecosystems like the EVM ecosystem, possibly Solana and others. That's us. Amazing. Thank you for the introduction, Alex. Really appreciate it. And thank you for um, putting up with the uh, with the delays and technical issues. Very no worries. Thank, thank you. Thank um, you. I think you had uh, you had a, a partner who was um, coming up to speak. Uh, if she still wants to come up, that's absolutely fine. Uh, we just need to we just need to if possible, maybe you can organise that if that if that um, if she comes back on. Uh, okay, everyone. I think it's probably best if we get on with some of the latest news and uh, and uh, get some interesting topics going on here. Um, so first things first, uh, we have um, something out of the US. Um, so um, this is a, a new bill, uh, a bipartisan bill, um, that aims to um, basically roll back uh, some of the um, perhaps questionable um, uh, rulings that the SEC has made regarding cryptocurrency and specifically with the custody of cryptocurrency. Um, so this um, basically all this started um, in 2022. Uh, with the SEC's uh, very <laughs> amazingly well-named Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. Uh, I know that's about the driest thing you've ever heard in the world, but it, it is relevant, I promise. Um, so basically, this um, this, uh, this uh, bulletin um, made it so that um, bank it made it very um, it, almost impossible for banks uh, to um, hold uh, cryptocurrencies on their balance sheets. Um, in uh, in any way that made financial sense. Um, so this is a, a bipartisan bill brought, brought between uh, um, it's um, it's got bipartisan support um, to uh, basically roll this back. It's called the Uniform Treatment of Custodial Assets Act, um, and it, it basically aims to um, bring parity between um, conventional assets like stocks uh, and uh, and cryptocurrencies. For the, for the purposes of, uh, of banks actually holding these things and not treating them differently from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, so making it, gen in, in, simple, in simple terms, making it actually possible uh, um, in, a, in, in a financial sense for banks to actually hold these things. So the SEC basically cites um, potential hacks uh, and security issues as the reason behind their unique guidance for crypto right now. So the question I'd kind of like to ask the panel is this, um, is crypto as it stands in 2023, too volatile, too insecure, or too dangerous to consumers for it to have a quality of standing with like any other assets, um, uh, custody rules? Or is the SEC simply like needlessly chasing innovation away from America and its borders? Uh, so that's the question. Uh, I'd like to perhaps uh, throw it maybe to Alex first, since uh, you've been waiting. I would, uh, I would love to get your take on that. Whether, whether that's the case. Um, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, so it, it's an interesting question. Um, in general, I think they are overreacting by a long shot. Uh, today, you can get exposed to crypto in a variety of different ways, uh, which are maybe not crypto native. Uh, uh, but if, if you're not, if people are not comfortable enough with self custody, um, there are tons of ways they can use, uh, buy and trade crypto using custodial solutions like Coinbase or other exchanges or uh, all the, you know, solutions like crypto.com and others. So uh, and those in general, um, some of them are properly regulated and audited. So I don't think they are any more dangerous than you know existing uh, financial institutions. Now that said, we must all agree that self-custody, if not done properly, still poses certain risks, right? But, but I think this is more up to the crypto community to explain and promote 
and find solutions. And I strongly believe that account abstraction wallets that will be coming and are already coming up, but will be a big topic for the coming year, uh, will be solving a lot of those issues and removing all this uh, self-custody risk. So a short answer is uh, they are overreacting and crypto is not dangerous per se, but with a caveat that self-custody uh, requires a certain level of understanding and discipline from the consumer. I, I would tend to agree. I mean, that's uh, it's it's really on the educational side, as you alluded to there. Like, uh, there's just not enough information about crypto, and certainly not enough reliable, easy to access information about crypto uh, for people to uh, for people to make a, a proper choice and uh, and uh, use these services properly. And yeah, I, account abstraction, absolutely massive topic. Uh, Vikram, uh, you you opened up your mic, please. Same question, or if you have any comments. No, actually, you. Uh, reflected my points. Uh, e even if I look at from a third world country, uh, all these countries in uh, Asia and Africa, people, uh, because I have experience working with uh, in these communities, uh, I, I, this is the point that you said, right? The education needs to be there. Uh, but on the other hand, I do, I do see some other problems. Like, let's say there is no regulation in crypto, then uh, Founders uh, rugging the project, this is a valid problem, you know. Uh, and I, whenever I speak, I very we, I talk very straightforward. So, so how do we stop founders from just rug pulling a project? And this sort of rug pulling doesn't happen in, in case of at least a regulated uh, like share market. There is, you know, it, it goes through a lot of other processes. So... So there are like very, uh, I don't agree completely that uh, there shouldn't be any regulation. But yeah, uh, but all the points that, you know, Alex said about uh, uh, SEC making it over complicated than it is actually, that is true. And second, like you just, uh, you know, reflected, not enough proper education is being done. Yeah. So, you know, that was my. Yeah. Ah, so that's, I, I, I would I would tend to agree again, Vikram. Um, but you, you you bring up a point that um, I, I've got near and dear to my heart, to be honest, um, is that um, democratized access, the kind of democratized access that um, the crypto provides uh, for people to um, like uh, create um, to create a public financial venture, um, it opens up the possibility of lower quality entrance. So you end up with like the the kind of rug pulls that you're talking about, you know, because you've got an open permissionless system. Anyone can access it. And there are a bunch of like uh, financial incentives that are not all aligned with uh, with what everyone uh, with what everyone wants in the space. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of a melting pot and uh, and a bit of a powder keg, to be honest, uh, for um, for potential um, uh, rug pulls. And that's. That's really where the regulate uh, the regulation part needs to come into play, I guess. Um, Paiman, uh, how are you doing? And um, and uh, uh, I guess same question, or if you have any uh, any any points of uh, comment, then. Yeah, I completely agree with the technical points, but I just want to like give an, a non-technical answer. Uh, I really think that we should be we should have been like even surprised if we didn't see this kind of pushback from the governments. Because it's a good sign, like it happens to all of the revolutionary technologies in the history. Uh, whenever we see like th things like internet, like even like cars, I don't know, trains or everything, even Uber, right? When you invent them, there's obviously a lot of ways that they can go wrong. Uh, even like AI and SEC or other regulate regulatories. Uh, for good or bad reasons, they will ob obviously take a deep look to them. Uh, there's always like fraudsters, there's always misunderstanding from the regulatory side. Uh, but these are the things that uh, can be solved with the condition that we are actually building something that matters, uh, something like the good infrastructure. So like the, in the early internet days, there's a lot of, I don't know, child pornography, a lot of bad stuff that it was happening. Uh, with the good like re regulatory, like they controlled it uh, with cars, uh, a lot of people are being died still in the streets. It doesn't mean that we should get rid of the whole technology, right? Um, I think like crypto, like the blockchain and decentralized 
technology is like the next big thing as like it's the continuation of like connecting words with like building more infrastructure for for like better DeFi and like social uh, infrastructure and this is simply because of the fact that we are in the really really early days of seeing this revolution and this is completely natural to see some kind of pushback from like responsible parties in the governments or uh, simply those who are afraid of losing their like power hubs absolutely yeah innovation and disruption it, it just it just leads to it leads to an awful lot of things both good and bad and we can we, we end up with we, we end up with some of these situations um it actually kind of leads into um, the the um the next um the next topic that i wanted to bring up really um and that's um uh you were probably all more than well aware of sam altman um he's a ceo at uh, OpenAI, and uh, he created worldcoin um basically he did a um he did a, a podcast with joe rogan like uh, maybe a few days ago i think even um and he's you know basically he's just saying that the you know, the the U.S. and various other jurisdictions are waging war on crypto right now. Uh, there's a whole like uh, 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 like socioeconomic and um, and uh, and um, just a, just a, just just this global set of incentives from governments that are trying that are causing them to um, to fight back against what they see as something um, that will um, either compete with. Or, um, or even maybe outcompete uh, traditional uh, tra traditional financial structures. Um, so he's he basically is was saying uh, on the podcast that um, he wants to. He says there's a potential for Bitcoin to be a universal currency, which is uh, and he says this is due to like its uh, its scarcity and um, and proof of work uh, consensus. Um, I'm not. 100% convinced on that myself, but uh, that's one of the things he said. Um, so um, he also said uh, that um, despite like the collapse of FTX and various other crypto firms over the last year or two, um, he still believes uh, in uh, in regulation, but says that excessive regulation doesn't always guarantee safety. It's fair enough, I think. Um, and he also uh, expressed um, concerns about uh, the growth of the surveillance state um, in digital payments um, where transaction flows can be watched, uh, I guess, especially with Bitcoin being, uh, being an open um, permissionless network. Um, so Joe Rogan himself actually shared, said that he, um, he's worried about the potential link between central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and social credit scores. Um, which uh, I think most people would probably share a similar kind of view on that. Um, so he's brought up a couple of things there. Um, so first, the, uh, the universal currency point. Second, that he um, uh, about the surveillance states. And uh, third, we have uh, Joe talking about CBDCs and social credit scores. So I guess my question to you guys on this one um, would be, where do you see... Um, um, where do you see the, the, the level of privacy required for people to transact, um, maintain their rights, um, and, uh, and uh, basically transact in a way that doesn't, um, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't bring people um, down to the point where ev literally everything that they do is watched by a government? Um, what level of privacy do people need to prevent them being um, um, used by malign actors, even if they're govern governments? Uh, so maybe we can go to uh, Vikram on this one first, and then we'll keep on going. Yeah, I um, see. I I am not like um, my, my macro is very bad. So the way I think, I always try to relate with what I am trying to do right now with my project or you know, customers if uh, or partners we are trying to, if we are trying to solve this particular problem. So one example I would like to take is, um, is recently we onboarded Indian national ID called Aadhaar onto hi uh, HyperSign infrastructure. Uh, many people are trying to do this, but one interesting thing that our developers could come up is that 
how can we uh, still be able to provide some sort of infrastructure where regulatory body whatever you know rules they have set that hey in case of someone who is doing wrong needs to be uh, produced on in in front of the court right and that's what the kyc system should be able to produce if even if you are uh, in implementing privacy all these facts needs to be produced uh, in case of anything if anything goes wrong but it doesn't say that you need to co- collect all the data uh, you know of a user and store and manage it right so so the the point is like the middle ground where the the technology can help uh, government or anyone to to bring just enough regulation in case of anything wrong but also not expose all the information of the user uh, end users so uh, so in this case for example i will be very specific and it will be little more technical but it will be simple to understand so aadhar has like id aadhar's id which is uh, supposed to be private and then all the you know aadhar information that supposed to be private and then it has a aadhar um, uh, reference number which supposed to be like it's not a private thing if in case someone has the reference number only with the right authority you can still have get the access through court or something so this is like a law in india in case of our design what we did is like we st- uh, instead of doing zero knowledge proof of users let's say age or uh, actual data we uh, bind it with the uh, reference id and with that id we were able to uh, we uh, first thing was that we were not storing any user data so there was no uh, user privacy uh, problem there and the second point was that in case of uh, you know regulatory bodies com- trying to uh, ask the kyc operators like how to get back to this user they have some sort of way to verify uh, you know the reference id number so sorry for this like long answer the point is that it needs to be thought through how we can work together while making sure that we are not exposing too much of users uh, personal information did i make sense <laughs> to oh, you guys yeah you you did vikram you did because Actually, india um, the point is indian government are like so strict that they don't allow anything uh, related with privacy when whenever it has to be law then it has to be law like everybody needs to be follow but on the other hand they are imposing privacy laws where they are saying that hey if you are storing and managing this data uh, and if anything happens with that data you need to pay 30 million dollar fine so now the businesses are confused what to do one law says that you need to collect data other law says that you if you are collecting data then you have to uh, protect it and expense of protection is you know keeping it safe is very high so probably developers need to just work with these guys it is going to be complex for sure but there will be like slow and steady you know uh, some sort of uh, uh, toolings and uh, solutions which will be a middle ground where we are not storing too much and where we are able to produce the facts that if it is required uh, i see that uh, many uh, actually privacy protocols also following similar approach uh, maybe other people can definitely add on to it like yeah, alex sure or thikram like um like uh, i i think you kind of you kind of sit in the same kind of position as galactica galactica perhaps in that you're trying to um uh, navigate this intersection of privacy and compliance uh, in a way that kind of makes sense for both for both sides uh, it's very admirable it's a very difficult thing to try and to try and balance um so yeah maybe we should uh, maybe we should go to alex um so where do you stand alex on um what what level of privacy is uh is um uh, what level of privacy should we have for consumers where do you stand on like uh, full anonymity uh swipe limiting or uh, this kind of like intersection of privacy and compliance. Yeah, so first of all I want to thank uh, Vikram for uh, for the summary and I agree with uh, all of the things he said. Um so uh about the level of privacy uh I would just start with looking at how the financial system and how the businesses work today. Right? So we're in crypto but still the banking system today is the prevalent uh instrument for businesses to transact and to 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 manage their accounts and all that 
And there is a certain level of privacy there, right? Although your bank knows everything, uh, but nobody else does, right? Your employees don't know, your competitors don't know, other people don't know, nobody knows what's going on in my personal bank account, uh, even if they know me very well and even they've transacted with me, right? So, um, and my thesis is that this is the minimum level of privacy that's required for businesses to really operate, right? And and I think, like, the fact that all the blockchains or most of the blockchains today are open, just blockchain is an open book, right? This is what really prevents uh, the mainstream business adoption of blockchain technology because think – how wonderful it would be for businesses to use USDC or USDT or their other favorite stablecoin to pay their employees all over the globe, right? And bank transfer takes three freaking days, right? It's crazy. And they ask for all kinds of papers to, to fill in before sending a, a 5,000 bucks somewhere, uh, which is terrible. But businesses don't do that, not en masse, right? Why is that? Because we don't have any privacy, right? Because any business that is paying in stablecoin immediately exposes everything to everyone, right? So I think the, the like the this is kind of a first principle, right? We need to get to at least at least that level of privacy where uh, only your bank knows, right? Uh, but this space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. Then uh, we started this whole crypto thing to get rid of the banks, right? We don't want banks. We don't want centralized actors, right? So we want it to be private, but also decentralized, right? Because we know that banks can do all kinds of bad things to you. And then, uh, yeah. So, um, so uh, then... When we realize that, that we need that kind of privacy, but we also realize that businesses must be compliant, right? You cannot just go and start using, you know, Monero or Tornado Cash, God forbid, to, uh, to, to conduct your business, right? Because then you will be immediately targeted by authorities and you will be having a very hard time of uh, going through any kind of audit. So you need to have a selective uh, selective kind of privacy. And this is, by the way, if you look at the cypherpunk manifesto from the 90s, right, it says that privacy is, is the power to selectively expose yourself to the world, which is exactly what we need, right? I want, as a business, I want all my transactions to be invisible to people outside, but if I want to expose them to my auditor, to the IRS, or to anybody else that I have to expose to, I need to have a good way. Right. And that's why we uh, we have what we call viewing keys or in secret network, we call them permits. And also we have viewing keys separately, which is a, a way for me to reveal the information in full and provably in full to a third party of my choosing. And that essentially boils down to what Vikram was saying. Yeah. So if there is a court order or if there is my desire to expose that to my auditor, we should have that capability. And uh, that is actually, once we have that and once we make it usable and once we make it easy to use and clear and uh, not as risky as people think it is, then businesses uh, will start coming on board and start using crypto because it has so many advantages over traditional banking system. But this particular thing is what prevents uh, prevents adoption. So, yeah, uh, privacy with selective disclosure to guarantee compliance. That's my view. Well, well said, mate. Well said. And uh, I absolutely love that you brought up the Cypherpunk Manifesto there. It's one of the uh, documents that we founded our, our protocol on as well. Um, this is uh, this is one of those things that um, crypto is going to have to come together on. Is just this, um, you know, maintaining the ethos that crypto was born with, um, this uh, this um, uh, freedom and uh, sense of self, and then uh, and then uh, squaring that with the uh, you know the regulatory requirements of humans. You know, we can't just uh, consider ourselves in a bubble. We have to remember that the 
the real world exists way too many protocols uh, forget that like the real world exists <laughs> and uh, that that is the uh, the primary interaction layer uh, that um, you know crypto as it stands uh, and uh, does we want it to be in the future is an extension of society it is not a replacement for it um, so we have to be able to play ball with each other uh, so that was actually beautifully said alex really well done um, lastly, I just want to go to Pyman or if for any other comments on this uh, on this uh, on this particular topic before we move on. Yeah, I actually I totally agree with Alex and your points, and uh, I really love the like the concept of gradual privacy, like the concepts like programmable privacy. It's not like a like zero or one thing that you either have like total privacy or you don't have any privacy. Uh, this is actually like our vision inside. Uh, fair block too so we are building like conditional decryption concepts and pre-execution privacy and for certain applications the transactions are like fully private and they will be only decrypted under certain conditions or uh, after like certain time uh, we can also use like concepts like fully homomorphic encryption or mpc to give access uh, to your auditor or like other people uh, I think we should play with these concepts to find the uh, like the like optimal point of privacy and applications and regulations uh, going toward the both ex- extremes on both sides are not uh, really realistic. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, that was, I actually really enjoy talking about that topic. I'd actually like to go more on that, but I have um, I have a lot. I have some more that I want to speak with you guys about. I want to pick your brains. Um, first, though, I just want to reset the space a little, guys. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who is listening right now, and who, uh, especially the ones who put up with the uh, the technical issues to begin with. Uh, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, if I could ask you for a favor, if you could uh, just uh, drop down to the comment section below, give us a like and a retweet on the space. It would really help us uh, get the space out for more live people and more importantly, even possibly uh, getting more people onto the recording so they can uh, have uh, have all this valuable education. Uh, it's uh, it's one of the things that we've been getting uh, a lot of success with lately is people uh, listening to the recordings. I think more people are listening to the recordings now than are listening to it live, which is a really nice milestone for us. Um, so um, if you could give us a like and a retweet, that would just help in that endeavor. And if you have any comments or questions, Feel free at this point uh, to uh, to uh, request to speak or to uh, or to put a comment below uh, because the the next uh, the next topic is going to be a, a good one too I think um, and on that note uh, the next topic uh, will be to do with the, the title topic which is uh, social pie versus privacy um, so I just like to open up the floor guys uh, because um, uh, obviously social fire is this uh, is kind of like a, an emerging kind of uh, sector it's kind of already it's not really like uh, new as such but it's emerging as a trend right now um so i would say um uh, i would just like to kind of ask what is what are your like initial impressions of social fire to begin with uh, as a concept and uh what ways do you believe um that it will affect this convergence of uh, of privacy uh and uh, and possibly compliance um, and what kind of um, challenges does it face, does it give us as uh, digital native kind of citizens um, with regard to um, education and privacy? Because I have seen with almost every one of these social fly protocols that they have launched without even a basic privacy policy and very little information. Uh, so I'd just like to get your like initial thoughts and opinions first before we go. Um, let's uh, let's just go to um, uh, let's go to Pyman first or more of us. Sorry, I didn't catch the exact question. Is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, what what do you think of uh, the concept of social fi um, and uh, and what do you what kind of effects do you uh, think? What do you feel about projects launching without even a basic privacy policy, for example? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we should like face the sad reality that like normal public doesn't care about privacy and for founders and like engineers their initial focus is just like having some kind of go to market and validating their ideas so they also can don't care about privacy so like historically in like web2 companies the only way that you can actually inject privacy is uh, 
um, yeah, by like just regulations and like pushing companies like Facebook by just finding them and like a lot of social pressure to add privacy layer and go under all of the technical trade-offs like differential privacy stuff. Uh, I think this has been always around. It, it does, privacy doesn't often come for free. There's a lot of like cost research and technical uh, trade-offs and like UX uh, costs. Uh, yeah, this is like certainly a challenge. And um, I think a lot of like public people that don't really care about privacy unless they're educated about the potential harms and uh, yeah, like why they should care. Like I don't know the classic debate of like I've not I've got nothing to hide, uh, like notion. But in crypto specifically, I think it's a, like really some like a specific area that sometimes privacy and having like encryption actually like saves you money in some cases and you can have the privacy like by default hopefully we can like provide a seamless experience because like the block times are even like higher than like real uh, time interaction so i really don't think that like we should go toward the path that users should choose between privacy or not having privacy um I think it, like we should provide the option and freedom to them, but like build an infrastructure that, uh, in some cases, like doesn't come with a lot of costs, and uh, it just basically have the privacy layer as a feature. It, it shouldn't be a luxury. Like in some cases, like bad MEV and like front running attacks is basic. Uh, it's just like exploiting users, and we shouldn't give them the <laughs> the like searchers this kind of privilege. Uh, in some cases, it's a like design choice, and which can, which doesn't come with a lot of like trade offs. I think it's quite unique in the in the crypto space compared to other industries. And uh, the good thing is the community cares about privacy a lot for various reasons, and this kind of uh, traction from the community is also really unique. I, I don't think in any other industry people care about like privacy. They are not asking for privacy as one of their main features uh which is this is a really good sign that people are pushing for privacy yeah i would tend to i would tend to agree with that and i think you're right in that crypto is a very unique case um it's um it's 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 born of the fact i guess that we are on uh, an open and permissionless network uh and so like uh the concept of privacy just comes up more often i guess uh, it's it's more of a more of a, an important talking point, um, but in 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 the same vein, I mean, people are simply not um, uh, people are not understanding or educated enough uh, on the topic uh, to understand the ramifications or like uh, either now or in the future of uh, of a lack of privacy, um, and I think people are giving away uh, their their data far too freely in this day and age. Um, uh, and so, like, I, I, I really, I do appreciate uh, a lot of the protocols and uh, people we have up on the stage today uh, are working towards uh, a more uh, um, um, privacy by more of as a default. Uh, Cosmos Hoss, please make have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to do like an overall. Like, I've just been kind of enjoying the conversation, to be honest with you, and just listening in and not having to speak, but just to kind of chime in on like an overall view of everything. So, there's a few points. One, obviously. Um, businesses, but not even businesses, huge money will not get into this space and transact and do things on blockchain because it is an open book, you know, and like I always visualize a blockchain is nothing more than a decentralized accounting ledger that's transparent and all, you know, like the numbers add up. It's just a perfect equation. And that's kind of why I got into this. One of the, one of many reasons why I got into crypto in the first place from my accounting background, it just makes sense. And then, like, and then philosophically and communitarian and everything else kind of like shifted me over towards the cosmos. And then, more in particular, shout out to the secret network is like I'm a real big privacy advocate because of 
I kind of grew up in the old world and now in the new world, you know, I, I wasn't an iPad baby or anything like technology was still pretty shit when I was in high school and, you know, but I've always loved technology, but the, the bottom line and the reality of it is, is that you have to have privacy solutions and layers in, in the, in this new, you know, I want to call it the new internet or web three or whatever you want to call it, because it just does, it won't make any sense. It won't be usable and that, you know, like it won't get mass adopted and you can use the business business aspects and everything else too but people aren't going to be trading uh derivatives and everything else if it's just like open for everyone to, to see it and it, it, there needs to be that layer of privacy it's just it's actually kind of dangerous well not even kind of it's very dangerous and, and i don't want to say that people don't care about privacy i think that's a misnotion i think maybe the younger generation has kind of just been um surrounded with this whole like everything's out in the open but you know i deal with a lot of people on the latter side of of life that are you know elders and everything and uh with my job and and i try to get them to use the computer to do a few things and, and they refuse and they're just like everyone knows everything about you on the computer and they still care about privacy you know and um and that's just not even them and you know, the money will filter into this, this, uh, I think the question earlier you asked, do you, do you see it as like a legitimate, um, I guess market? Yes. Crypto is going nowhere. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I mean that in a good way. When you see like JP Morgan's and Larry Fink from BlackRock, just really wanting a piece of the action, then it's just a matter of time. Cause really they're, they're the ones on the top calling all the shots, essentially for the whole entire world. I mean, uh, BlackRock has more wealth than I think every nation except for maybe America and maybe UK or somewhere. But other than that, they have more money on their management than nations do, you know, like the entire world. So it's like they're going to get what they want. That's just the way life works. But um, we just need to keep building and plugging along because crypto is, is going to it's just going to keep moving forward. And that's one thing about technology. Like, the, like you were saying earlier, I, I forget if it was um, – Pi was saying it was a really good reference about like Ubers and stuff. You know, in America, there used to be the way of, the main transportation was with you know horses, and then it was the buggies, and then it, it was uh, then it was jitneys, and then it was cat. You know, like it was just like all, like the the you know you can go all the way through the timeline, and and every single time that there was always transition or change people are always scared of change and they always put up a fight. You know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, well, guess what? You're not a kid anymore. And everything evolves. That's just how humanity is. And crypto is evolving. It scares the shit out of like boomers and older people because they don't understand it, you know, and they don't get it. They, they just don't understand technology for the most part at all. People that are older, no knock to older people. There are some that do, but it's a very minuscule amount. Like they all want the world to just keep going backwards, but that's just not how it is. It's just going to keep going forward. And crypto is going to be a big solution. Solution of it. Now, is Bitcoin the, the universal money? I don't know about that, but I do think it'll always be around because people know how much there is of it, you know, the supply, and people know that that's, it's pretty much a good spot to keep your, your wealth and, and your, you know, energy. Let's just call it energy. And um, you can't get diluted because one of the things with money is it's really for the most part, it's a symbolization of time because you have to, you know, concern so much energy and time to make whatever you get. And then when the, the, these governments keep printing more of it, they're essentially stealing your time. They're diluting your wealth. They're doing all that. But as at least with Bitcoin, you know, you have this hard asset that you can conserve and put your energy and your time into it. And you know, they can't really necessarily like print more Bitcoin. So like, I think that'll always be around. I don't know about the universal, um, I think it could replace gold as and get up to b gold's uh, market cap, which is like in the you know 10x from now or how much it is from, from this point. But that's kind of my rant. I just want people to stay positive. I know the market conditions in the world, and sorry to hear what you're going through, Alex, over in Israel, and it's a shame, you know, what's going on. And um, you know, I hope everything's good over there and with your family and everyone else. And you know, I just think um, you know we're we're here to stay. Um, if crypto doesn't work, then I honestly firmly believe this is the last vestige and, and thing that can like kind of save humanity or make it a lot better than what it is now. Because it's really, as you see what's going on in the world, it's really going to, to, to shits, no pun intended. And um, there needs to be a reset. 
And, you know, I think all the boomers pretty much control pretty much all the wealth on planet Earth. And, you know, one thing about humans, we all pass away. So they're going to pass away and then they're going to hand it down to younger people. And it's a fact that younger people, their their life is is technology and, and uh, crypto and everything else. And it's just going to happen whether they want it to happen or not. It, it's just evolution. So I don't know if it happens as fast as we would like it. I don't know. I can't predict that. But I do firmly believe that. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, uh, crypto is going to be a huge solution to like everything, in my opinion. But that's my little take on everything. If I may add, uh, that is really beautiful. Uh, I, I didn't say that people don't care about privacy just because like they, I don't know, they care, like a lot of people care about privacy. But right now, they simply like having their friends and their family on Facebook more than their individual privacy the con- that caught the individual cost for them to have privacy is much more than they tolerate so i think the good point about crypto is that we can build applications that has like some kind of privacy built inside it uh, which comes with like much less uh, like individual cost for interacting with them uh, which is like quite good compared to like i don't know just uh, by building your social media on by, on facebook and sharing it with pretty much everyone. Yeah, that's actually a, a really interesting point. Um, so, um, like, there's, um, I don't know, there's, 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 there's a, there, I, from what um, Hoss was saying as well, I, I think I think you're right. There is a, there is some kind of, like, generational gap in, um, in the willingness, um, uh, and the, like, there's this will and, uh, and uh, and the will leading to implementation of um, of actually wanting uh, a certain minimum level of privacy, um, uh, but like I think that we've also kind of, um, especially the the younger generations, have gotten addicted to convenience, um, and like to the point where you know we're we're arguing right now about like um, um, whether blockchain. Um, is uh, uh, is a replacement for like the banking system, for example. Um, but um, you know, is there? And we, a lot of people, uh, proponents of banking, to, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people who would argue against blockchain say that it's, uh, for instance, doesn't scale and it's too slow. Um, but then you realize that you know, as uh, as I think it was Alex said, um, like banking banking tra- bank transactions take days. They take days. And uh, and people that just like people require seem to require this level of um, like centralized speed that can only be achieved through centralization. Like for instance, on uh, on I, I, I'm not maligning the project at all, but things like Solana stuff like that that can go like uh, uh, microsecond speeds, but um, there are there are severe um, drawbacks to it in regards to centralization. Uh, sorry, Alex, uh, you just took your uh, uh, my mic off. I'd love to hear your opinion. Yeah, so uh, this was a great conversation. I think it went to some very philosophical and, and very high areas. Um, I want to I, like I want to come back for for a second to social fi, right, which we started with, um, and be a little bit contrarian here. So I think, uh, unlike the financial system, right, the social networks are in a way kind of about being public for, I mean uh, when you when you build when you open up your Twitter account <laughs> like you're striving for uh, the more the merrier right you want everyone to know what you have to say right so you're not trying to hide anything of course if we're talking about private messaging that's another thing um, you don't want your private uh, correspondence but social networks are actually about being public yes those companies uh, are actually using our data and we are our our <laughs> ourselves and our souls are kind of the payment for 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 this uh, fun uh, but I think kind of social networks is sort of an antithesis to privacy so so people are not looking for privacy there uh now of course things can be improved of course there is this risk of facebook getting hacked and my uh my uh private posts or my private information being published all over the place 
But I think most people, when they actually access social networks and when they do something there, they kind of want it to be public. So this is one part of it. Now, it doesn't mean that this cannot be improved by social fi, but there is another thing which is uh, hurting social fi. Uh, and this is the network effects, right? So Facebook has what, like two billion users, and then it, like everyone, like Twitter, has whatever, like a billion, and um, and these are those huge behemoths that are, are very hard to, to, to move anywhere, right? So, of course, we can build some very nice social networking applications on the blockchain, which may even have uh, similar user experience, but bringing people onto those places will, will be hard. Right. So maybe if this beautiful platform we are we are we are we are talking on right now, maybe if it fails miserably and it closes down, then maybe there will be an opportunity for a Web3 project to take it to take its place. But I think uh, the value prop, the value proposition of blockchain for social is at least for now, at least for, for, for my knowledge, it's not strong enough versus Web too right so i uh am a little skeptical about you know social fi uh overtaking the the web to social networks there will be very and there are very nice projects but they are kind of targeting the crypto guys and not the normies so i don't think this is the direction that will take uh blockchain or web3 to the masses i'd love to be mistaken about that i'd like to be i'd love to be totally wrong but that's that's my view at the moment i absolutely love that and i really appreciate it, alex because um that's one of the that's one of the things that i like to make sure i point out to to people um in general when i'm on spaces or when i'm just communicating on, on social networks um is the difference uh, there's the, the, there is a very definable difference between um, these like um, social fi protocols in which um, like uh, you have um, you're linking you're basically just linking blockchain linking blockchain addresses and uh, with, a, with, a, with and then putting them on a on a very steep bonding curve uh, of the financial bonding curve um, and um, where, and the difference between a social fi protocol and decentralized society. Um, so, um, I, I think the financial part of social fi, like the fi part is the problem here, um, because too many people don't really understand what they're getting into with, with, uh, with social fi protocols. you you sign up, you use your, you know, you, in general, these things work by, um, by, um, thinking you're like a, like another social account, like a web two social account, like Twitter or whatever it is. Um, and then they uh, and then they do like the blockchain stuff on the back end, uh, which is uh, like the they put you on a bonding curve and then they um, they give you like uh, fees they, they give you a portion of the fees they they promise you an airdrop whatever the hell it is they just put a bunch of financial incentives um, in there um, for you to uh, for you to take part in and uh, take advantage of. Uh, whereas decentralized society is almost the antithesis of that. It's um, the decentralized society is for, for reference something that Galactica Network is aiming to um, provide a foundation for, um, and it requires essentially that you have the ability, like uh, the optional ability, to um, remove the financial incentives from the social interactions, um, because otherwise the financial incentives, almost without uh, without question or doubt. They will overcome the, any any social um, any social benefit or incentive that might be there. Uh, and you know, human human beings we we operate on uh, on greed and what's best for us in most situations, uh, at least on a personal level. Um, and uh, and yeah, so decentralized society as a concept is a very different thing to social fi. Uh, and I think blockchain as a as a as a platform is in fact the only way that we can have any form of um, uh, society in a digital sense, let alone a decentralized sense, in a digital sense. And I say that because um, mostly because of the inevitable tide of artificial intelligence and quantum computing that's just around the corner. So we've seen what kind of, uh, what kind of power 
even the simple generative models that we have now can do um, regarding um, like uh, pretending to be uh, vaguely human, um, where you, you, know, you can only imagine the, the level of complexity an artificial identity will have 10 years from now, for example, after you know the first round of quantum computing, we have like quantum state powered um, art, um, artificial identity. It's going to be um, not only indistinguishable from a human, but probably superior to it, at least uh, in like the digital sense without a physical presence. Um, so I think blockchain is the salvation for um, humanity as far as um, actually being able, because it is our best digital solution for proving things. And one of the things you can prove uh, is humanity. You know, you have to be able to verify yourself as a human being in the coming decade, or you'll probably get lost to the, you know, this artificial tide. Um, and now I'll, I'll, you know, actually, I think I'll just throw it out to the, uh, to the panel because I've spoken for a bit. Um, so if you have any comments on, on anything I've said, please do. Uh, and uh, we'll probably start to wind down after this particular topic because I realize we've been going uh, longer than I thought I had. <laughs> I was just going to add to your, like, the social fi thing. I, I never really got into it, but how, like, about a week ago, I was, Maybe, maybe about a week ago. I tried a couple of them out. The one was like on AVAX. It was actually not that bad. It was called like Stars Arena, but then it got hacked and like the contract was no good. It wasn't bad. And then there was another one that I started to like look into, but then I totally was like, nope. It was on Solana. It was actually really cool looking. The, the thing that drew me away from it was, um, I think it was called like Hub 3. But anyways... You can zoom like every single user that signs up and deposit its like soul or whatever. You can click on it and see exactly where they're located at on the planet. And not only that, like you can zoom in and it pretty much goes all the way to like the street. It's like, no, this is kind of weird. Like, why would someone? I don't know. That's just me. I'm a really big privacy person. Like, I joke about this, and people probably heard me say this. But, you know, I say hi to my neighbors and things. I, I live where I don't really have, like, close neighbors, like, right next to me or anything because I couldn't live like that. You know, shout out to people that do. I, I just can't do that. But anyways, even if I did, you know, I'll be respectful. Hi, how are you doing? But I don't get in people's businesses. Like, I just don't care what people do, you know. And and that's kind of like, I guess, to Pi's point is there <laughs> there's a lot of people that just don't care. Like, they want to they want go on these social files. And to Alex's point, too, like, I think, I kind of agree with him with it because um, I, I think when it comes to, to Twitter that um, the X, whatever you want to call it, I think Elon's kind of doing a good mixture of both. And um, But yeah, these social files, some of them, they're not bad for me just looking into them. But yeah, it's going to take a lot and you need it to be really good. And not only that, I think these app stores aren't going to allow them to have their own app and be mobile. They're going to have to kind of use their their mobile phone and connect in like through the back way of, of APIs with Twitter and it's just not a good user experience. That's how I had to do it on mobile. I couldn't just download the mobile app. It had to go to Stars Arena's Twitter and then you like click their their website and go run it through there. It's just not really that good of a of a you know UI UX experience. So but yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting for sure, uh with 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 social fi. I think it'll be around, but if I was going after people to Alex's point, just in general, just not even just with social fi, I would just try to go towards normal people that aren't even in crypto right now. You know, you can cater a little bit to crypto people, but we're such a small amount of humans on planet Earth, in my opinion. So anyways, continue. <laughs> Sure. Um, Alex, if you have any, any comment, please. Um... Uh, no, no, I'm good at the moment. Thank you. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, okay, guys. Um, so uh, on, 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 on that note, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll probably try to wind it down because uh, uh, I realize we've been going uh, longer, again, like I say, a bit longer than I expected. Uh, as far as um, like, uh, the, the, the social fi, um uh, getting normal people onto social fi, I'm not sure. Like I say, I don't know if people would want to um, um, like monetize their social interactions in like a, like normal people would want to do it. It's a, it seems like one of those um, systems that is built for for crypto people, like uh, for self uh, for, for for the kind for crypto people to like a, a sandbox for them, you know. 
Uh, I'm not sure how I feel how I feel uh, normal people would get on board with that. Um, yeah, um, Pie Man, perhaps uh, do you have any um, like uh, comments on anything we've just discussed, or perhaps if you want to start off with a final thought, that's fine too. Yeah, I think uh, we don't. We definitely don't need something like friend tag for like like pub lab, like most of the people in the world. Uh, if we are going to have some application that has like better privacy, uh, the experience, the UX should be exactly the same. Uh, like should probably better than what we have in Twitter. Uh, the part that I'm more interested to see and I'm like more bullish on is that uh, probably, for example, right now you should prove that you have like a number, a phone number, you're an actual person, you're not a bot in Twitter. Maybe we can use like concepts like you know, ZK proof for that reason or like. But the part that I care more about is that, like for example, Twitter or other major companies. Yes, like we are on social media. We agreed that we want to have like social interactions and we are sharing information uh, with our friends. This is not the problem. I think the problem is that they are gathering like data about our like interests. Uh, about our like personal life and they are forming a society by like targeted advertisement and uh, in some cases uh, there is like uh, I don't know cases of like discrimination and other stuff like for example if you are applying for a US visa they're asking for your social media handles or they have I don't know for Patriot Act and this kind of stuff they have the just the blind <laughs> they can blindly submit a lot of application uh, requests to like Twitter to release your information from that uh, company. And most of the times they are not really transparent. They, they have like transparency reports, but it's that something that public can really access to them like easily. So I think one thing that I personally really like to see is that having some kind of decentralized governance, more transparency on how on the process of sharing private information and how we are monetizing them. And what's the effect of that on the society, like specifically because of the ads and also like uh, security and government. Uh, on the application side, I don't think we should do anything else. Like it's just how we are handling the private data in a decentralized and more transparent way that is more important to me. Hundred percent, Pi. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's massively important. I think that's one of the one of the. Um, one of the uh, primary concepts that we're going for at Galactica as well is um, is the self sovereign control of your data. You know, um, that's why why we use CK proofs uh, again, same kind of way that you've been describing. In that, you know, you can transact with your proofs rather than with your data. It's far far safer, far more secure, and it's uh, uh, obviously that it maintains that level of privacy that you want. Uh, just uh, just in general, when you're using a uh, an open an open ledger, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a massively important concept. Um, Alex, I don't know if you just want to give us uh, maybe a final thought or two. Um, we would love to love to hear your final thoughts before we uh, before we wrap this thing up. Yeah, well, so I think uh, like my my um, kind of summary would be that uh, you know blockchain is great in my view for some applic some applications, but not all applications, right? So as we discussed, the social might or might not be uh the the best application for uh for blockchain we know for sure that financial applications money transfers shore value uh trading uh they work just great and privacy would improve those immensely and bring more and more people on board uh it doesn't mean that we need to bring everything on uh on the blockchain like we don't have to bring necessarily bring all of the social platforms to the blockchain. We don't have to bring, uh, you know, uh, supply chain transparency or, I mean, there are a lot of kind of crazy use cases that you feel are just, you know, like forcefully uh, brought to the blockchain just to, just to make it sound cooler. Uh, so I think, and I think as an industry we are maturing and we're finding those right product market fits where first blockchain fits and also where privacy on blockchain fits. 
And uh, I think we should just continue and find those use cases and not spend too much time on use cases that just maybe sound nice, but don't really bring any value compared to their Web2 implementations. Uh, and uh, so, so that, that's one thing. And another thing, I think we all in our projects, we need to think about better user experiences, easier uh, onboarding, uh, smoother operations, removing friction. And that is actually where, where the, new, uh, the new people will come from. That's where the next billion will be able to join us. 100%. If you uh, if you if your uh, if your use case uh, if you're building a use case that doesn't make any sense, it's uh, it's not going to get adopted for sure. And um, and yeah, obviously uh, UX uh, UX is obviously been one of the uh, one of the classical weaknesses of our industry, and I really hope that that and that, uh, that improves uh, very quickly too. Um, we need uh, we need that kind of uh, seamlessness uh, that people are used to. You know, like I, like I was talked about earlier, people are. Um, people uh, are very much used to the kind of convenience that they have, and they don't want anything to change. I guess you know if uh, we, as you're saying, you know, we use the uh, use the use cases the blockchain is good for, and then put them on the back end, and then allow for the concept of a self-sovereign individual uh, to to remain and endure. Uh, and that's uh, I guess that's the the main part. Uh, Hosme. Uh, it's absolutely been uh, a really cool space uh, today. Uh, just love to get your final thoughts before we uh, before we uh, 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 run this thing. He caught me right in between eating a potato chip. <laughs> well, then don't be eating potato chips while you're on the space. Actually, it wasn't doing? even a potato chip; it was a tortilla chip. But no, I was just eating dinner. So, but no, it was a really good conversation in general. I I pretty much agree with everything that everyone said. Um, yeah, I mean it's. Um, Privacy is a huge aspect of everyone's life, and I think that there needs to be a, a, a better balance than it was in Web 2 because it really got out of hand. And, you know, there's like horror stories about things are just, yeah, it's it's bad and um, it's not okay that people and companies and entities prospered and use that data and manipulate people. And, and essentially, at the end of the day, they're just div dividing a lot of us, you know, and it's kind of sad that the old world really wasn't like that and in the new world it's kind of been like that and uh i just want something better for all of us and i think crypto can offer that and i think crypto right now is more on the monetary monetary side of things which you know I, I, it's, that's obvious but it's nice to see and i've been more um looking f more looking forward to things that are being built right now that aren't necessarily just DeFi applications and just to get other people into this space because i think once people get into this space and and experience it and have a good good experience that they'll, they'll stick around or come back you know and that's just one at a time and i do think like alex said about you know the next billion users i i do see it happening i don't know necessarily if it's just going to be from monetary side but it needs to be gaming music like decentralized society and just like whatever whatever it is to to make people feel more safe and secure and uh, yeah man it's just um exciting times ahead i'm honored to always be here shout out to everyone that listens stayed in listens to the recording you know keep doing your thing appreciate everyone listens to my reverberating voice at the beginning of the podcast i'm gonna be embarrassed about the days uh yeah um, i'd like to um uh, just to maybe leave everyone with uh, a final thought from my side too. Um, so um, I, I realized that Alex, uh, you are uh, on the fence, I guess, about the social side of blockchain. Um, I get the feeling that maybe you're on the fence about like the decentralized society aspect as well, and that's absolutely fine. Um, all I'll say in uh, in, uh, in that regard um, is that um, I think personally, it's a, it's an absolute requirement. Um, that we um, decentralize, um, uh, we decentralize almost every power structure we can. Um, right now, especially when we're dealing with people and uh, and uh, globalization and uh, people's reputation in particular, um, because you know, right now, you if you have um, a digital social reputation kind of system uh, and you have a centralized entity controlling it. Um, that's that's power of everyone. For example, like um, the the Chinese implementation of, uh, of a social credit score, 
um, it's uh, that's that's the kind of thing that you um, you might end up with. Like right now, even it's kind of it's kind you can kind of argue that it's working, right? Um, because uh, the Chinese people, uh, uh, in general, just happy with the convenience it offers. The problem occurs when um, the Chinese government decides that you know it can suddenly has all these tools available to it in a critical situation, uh, and it decides that it can control people. Um, so I believe that uh, like uh, these uh, these social these uh, social systems uh, and, uh, and reputational systems they do need to be decentralized, and um, and that's one of the one of the things that I'm very passionate about. And we will. Uh, try and make it and try and uh, very much prove that it is a, a viable use case as well. Uh, so, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for your input and thank you for your points, Alex. Uh, it's been absolutely really, really, really valuable having you on the show. Uh, and again, guys, I, I really appreciate you uh, in the listener panel as well as on the speaker panel, uh, especially for the uh, for the, uh, the hiccups at the beginning there. Uh, thank you for sticking around. It's been an absolutely amazing space with some great takes and some really good education. So if you could do us all a favor and give us a like and retweet on the space as you leave the, as you leave the room, uh, that would help a lot of people get to the recording and educate more people. Uh, and I'd really appreciate it. Uh, there will be another space. Uh, this will be a, a regular space on a Thursday at the same time, uh, eight o'clock uh, uh, UTC. Um, so please join us on the next episode uh, of uh, Into the Cypher State. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate your time and I hope you guys have a wonderful Friday and uh, an even better weekend. Uh, so thank you for joining us on this episode and we will see you next time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. It was amazing. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs>